Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season here today with your hosts, Lisa and Venkat. Venkat, how's it going today? Not bad. Things are good. Um, kind of looking up in LA right now. Yeah, the, I think the we just opened up more so we can go to like the gym and stuff. So, yeah. Are you a big gym goer, Venkat? No, I'm not, but I like to have the option. I see, into so, optionality. Yeah. Um, I mean, I go a couple of times a week if I can, if it's available. Yeah, so um, cool. So today we're talking about the letter T. Um, we're gonna talk about, let's talk about thinking, T for thinking. <laughs> um, right. What do you think about that as a topic, Venkat? I'm thinking. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I have thoughts about thinking. I mean, let's start with the easy one. Like, do you like thinking? Uh, I think thinking is a thing that my brain does on its own without me having to, I don't really have a lot of control over the thinking thing. I think this is why people meditate. Maybe we should get into that. Um, the, uh, but yeah, I think that, do I like thinking? I like it when it's like fun things, like the, there's like, there's two kinds of thinking. There's thinking in domains that I'm trying to like solve a problem my brain is like, doesn't want to do it. That sounds weird. It seems to happen anytime I'm like working on debugging something. Um, <laughs> that's not as much fun, but the there's the other kind of thinking that feels a lot, I think the way I would describe it is a lot like daydreaming um it's so kind of like shower thinking where you're like just sort of like exploring thoughts in your head it's like kind of just new thoughts come up and you follow them and like new scenes appear and you like see what happens um and sometimes it lets you understand better things about the world around you um that kind of thinking is super fun so i like doing that all the time yeah i think the two kinds of thinking you described they actually have uh... Uh, neurological basis. Have you heard the terms? Uh, I think a default mode network and uh, task positive thinking. No. Okay. So default mode network is uh, what's sometimes known as mind wandering. When your mind doesn't have to be focused on something in particular, it can kind of go back into like just um, reflective daydreaming, wandering kind of cognition. That's called the default mode network. And the other kind is usually called task positive. So there's like Wikipedia articles on both of these. So default mode is sometimes also called task negative and the opposite is task positive. And that's what you would describe as when you're thinking in an externally directed way about problem solving or something like that, where it's focused with like particular sort of domain dependent uh, sort of um, rules to how you should think. So yeah. so. I think, yeah, I, since we're both INTPs, it kind of makes sense that both of us like um, the default mode network type thinking. And the other, like, uh, I know people who are the exact opposite. So that's the externally oriented thinking type. They absolutely feel a lot of stress when they're forced into like the default mode, mind wandering mode. And they love it when they're like in a high stress, uh, physical outward thinking mode. Like a friend of mine does uh, uh, kite surfing. So kite surfing is a context when you really have to be there. Like you have to be paying attention to the wind and the board and the water. And if you sort of lose attention, you could fall and like hurt yourself or something, I guess. So yeah, I think it's a personality type. So people seem to like thinking about one or the other. Yeah, I like, I the doing the one, what you said default network mode and the other one was? Task positive, uh, but that's surprising. You're a, uh, programmer and in a fairly detailed oriented critical kind of application area where small mm -hmm. mistakes can like lose millions or something like that right yeah yeah i mean i think like i do best when i'm able to like marry the two and like manage to bring whatever the like under my understanding of like the project i'm doing into my default node whatever mm -hmm. default Network. Well, you can't quite do that. I mean, if you're doing a detail oriented task where you kind of have to like write bug free, bug free code and it has to like do transactions, you kind of have to do it. I don't think you can, 
it's not that you can use default mode network for task positive work or vice versa. You have to use the right kind of thinking mode for that kind of task. I mean, uh, it, it I mean, determines it content. It's like saying, I'm going to listen with my eyes. You can't do that. Yeah, you see with your eyes and you listen. Totally to true, Venka. You can find a visualizer. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, I think it's like the, what do you call it? I mean, so it kind of depends on what kind of task you're trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you already, man, if you already know and understand the problem domain that you're trying to solve, I don't, uh, how to explain? Like, I think there's kind of like the sorts of problems that you're solving sort of depends on what you're doing. So like a lot of programming is like figuring out the right way to do a thing. Um, and that kind of understands, I would say like almost kind of like a nice merging between, um, I mean, just this is the way my brain works. I don't think other people's brains work these, this way, but um, being able to like think through a process is a really big skill in programming. And that involves being able to like hold kind of all of the different states in your head and move through how they interact together um, so that you end up like figuring out what a good, being able to do this like skill of like holding kind of all the different parts and how they interact, what their interactions are in your head lets you prototype code a lot faster because you can like run it through your head and figure out what's not going to work before you even try to start. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, but I'm saying that's not default mode work. That's task positive type thinking because what you just described is not, for example, at all similar to daydreaming. Daydreaming, free association, that's not thinking through I see. Uh, how a task should be structured. So it sounds like you like both and you kind of like <laughs> blending the two. But uh, as I say, but if you're like daydream about what the context looks like, then that's like, it's similar. It's like a similar thing. It's just like- what Yeah, I think it, for me, the way it works is the sort of, um, mind wandering daydreaming mode allows me to like see the right approach to a problem. But once I've actually seen the approach, then I kind of have to switch gears and like think about the details and put them in the right order and think it through and stuff. So yeah, yeah. I switch back and forth too. And actually tools make a lot of difference. Like, did you ever see things like uh, Brett Richter's dynamic land experiment or Seymour Papert and others? So they like take things like programming tasks and like create I don't know, embodied visual kind of ways of looking at the problem. So kind of a boring bureaucratic task becomes a daydreaming sort of more exploratory task. Yeah, that, I mean, this is like, I think we're kind of getting at an interesting thing about like thinking or like, it's like visualization or like what your like environment for doing the thinking is. Um, so yeah, having environments that help you kind of compose and recompose the pieces or have a better uh, reification of the ideas or the constructs that you're attempting to like piece together is helpful for prototyping, making things go faster, right? Um, That's very abstract. So for me, when I think of things like that, I think in literal terms of tools, like, you know, an IDE, if I'm working on a code, which I haven't done in a long time, or for writing, am I writing with pen and paper or the digital interface or like, you know, working with like literal tools like uh, soldering iron or like, you know, pliers or something like that. So I think, uh, I think I'm, I used to be a lot more abstract, but the older I've gotten, the more I've become like an embodied thinker. Like I think with uh, the tool I happen to be holding. So what tools do you like to hold these days? I think these days I like to make it as physical and tangible as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, let me show an example, actually. Hold on. Look at this. What is this thing, Kat? So it's this red. is part of my Mars rover project. I see. So let me see if I can like show it in a better way. Okay. So what this is, is called a differential bar. Mm. And the way it works is, can you see this bar moving back and forth? I see you have like a, a looks like a seesaw. Yeah. So what bar. this is, is this is the chassis of the rover and each side would have a set of wheels, three wheels. Mm -hmm. And the way the Mars rover is designed, you wanna have it so that if one wheel goes up, say the front left wheel goes up, you want the front right wheel to go down to retain traction. Just like, you know, with human hips, if you put your weight on one foot, the other foot kind of has to like take more or, 
or if you're climbing up a step with one foot, the other foot should have more weight. So that's what this mechanism is supposed to do. So you can see as I move one side, the other side moves down. So this to me is uh, very embodied thinking and it's a way, and I like uh, saw the videos and how the thing worked. I couldn't quite figure out figure it out. And the only way I could actually properly figure it out is to actually try and reconstruct the whole mechanism. So these rods are like two ball joints with a connected with the rod, it's called a turnbuckle. And these are 3D printed parts. I printed this thing. So, and these are ball joints over here. So it's like a fairly complex mechanism that moves in three dimensions. And I couldn't quite like get an intuition for how it worked. And like I had an idea of how it worked, but until I actually built it, I couldn't. And this is what I think of as extremely embodied thinking, like just build a damn thing and like play with it to see how it works. Whereas when I was a mechanical engineering undergrad in like 1995, mm -hmm. and I took a course called kinematics of machinery, which is how machines move in geometry. That was all math and like drawing like uh, geometric diagrams and doing like trigonometric calculations. And it was kind of like a very abstract way of getting to intuitions about how machines worked. So I, I think there's a good sort of illustration of like two different ways of thinking. And I think over the years, I think as I've gotten slower at the abstract thinking and basically less smart, the more embodied I can make something, the easier it is for me to think about it. So I, I do this a lot more these days. Like I try and embody the problem as much as possible. What kind of thoughts did you get after you constructed this, this particular piece? Well, in this case, first of all, confirmation that my initial intuition about how it worked was actually correct. That, um, and I had like metaphors for like, you know, holding two horses and they're trying to pull at each other and stuff like that. So I had like a, uh, intuitions I didn't trust. So it validated the intuitions, that was good. And the other thing was, it gave me ideas for follow on experiments. Like I want, I now want to do an experiment where it's, when I look at, if I push one side down, how much force is generated on the other side? So how much force does the differential bar transmit from one side to the other? I so see. stuff like that. So it gives you ideas for follow on stuff. Whereas if I did the same problem with like, you know, geometry calculations, it would take me down very different routes. Like I might think of like a geometry theorem I want to prove instead, right? Yeah. So it's like how you do the, the tool you use to do the thinking determines what you'll think about next. Yeah, that makes sense. That's interesting. So what's a good example of um, that illustrates your thinking recently? Do you, are you building a Mars rover? You're not. I'm not building a Mars rover. I just started a new, a second, another newsletter because I definitely need more of those in my life um, to write. So um, I guess I do a lot of my thinking in writing. It's kind of fun. I think like, I think there's definitely, so like I think writing, writing actually is an interesting, I think, place to locate the sorry i can't remember the network thinking mode yeah default, default mode network yep default new network um thinking because sometimes i'll have like vague concept or ideas or like be it's almost like the awareness of a room <laughs> some ideas i would describe is the awareness of a room that exists that you haven't gone to explore yet um and the best way to explore it and for me is often to either have a conversation with someone where you attempt to like get through it or more likely than not um having writing down some thoughts about what's in that room and how the room is constructed and like what it looks like standing in that room. What is the view of the world from that room? Um, so I don't- Are you good at that kind of visualizing? Like if you close your eyes and try to remember say the San Francisco home you lived in, yeah. can you visualize it in which detail? I, maybe, I think so. I mean, okay. uh, so this is interesting. My- I'm talking about a Fantasia because I can't, I'm- uh... I can't actually do mental visualizations well. Interesting. I have a pretty strong, like a lot of the times that I figure out like what I think is going to happen in the future, or have predictions about things going forward. A lot of them are, I would call it like, you know how like, this, I, this is like a weird thing to talk about, but I would almost call myself a seer, like S-E-E-R. Um, because the way that I understand the future or what's going to happen is I see it happen. Um, I put things together like so when I'm in the shower I am like literally daydreaming the future and watching what happens and like kind of follow certain thread thoughts and then all of a sudden you like arrive at, at the conclusion but it feels like a bit of a physical wandering like in a visual space thing and is this like um, sort of a normal point of view like you're looking with your own eyes in some sort of future scene 
where you're with somebody having a conversation is it that kind of visualization no, or more like, it's like, like dreaming it's it's like dreaming um okay. uh, but it's visual like uh in the way the dreams are visual okay this is where i think you and i can't really communicate because i i told like i mentioned um, i i think i have a fantasia you've heard the term right yeah like the guy in facebook wrote that big post about it and then suddenly a lot of people looked at that and said hey i have that too but yeah basically i really suck at visualizing like if i close my eyes and try to think of like a scene i'm familiar with nothing pops up it's like a blank screen like i can very occasionally think in terms of like very vague outlines especially if it's something like geometric objects but if i try to think for example of my mom's face i can't actually conjure it up like i can obviously recognize or something like that but i can't actually conjure up images that should be very familiar to me can you not supposedly i mean i can remember what photos look like <laughs> so i'm more likely to remember a photo i've taken than a scene but but like your mom's face or your dad's face can you like if you close your eyes right now can you see them in your mind's eye yeah you can okay so you don't have a fantasia because i can't really no. do that oh okay uh, so it's like hard for me when you say the way you're daydreaming random future thoughts is like dreaming you're assuming a referent that's different for me because dreaming is not like that for me because my dreams are not super rich colorful vivid it's not like colors like they're like it's concepts you like Conce dream with okay. the concept the concept has a representation you dream in concepts yeah I like, don't know what that means. Things happen. Give me an example. I'm thinking in a movie. Um I'm thinking about like I so I've written down some dreams. I don't know like uh I think what once it's like I think a recent dream I had was I was moving places, I was moving houses and I there was like a moving truck and so I was at a big house and there was a big big ornate door. I was trying to get someone inside the house to come let us in because we had arrived with all the stuff in the moving truck and the moving truck was like parking in the way and so i was worried about like blocking the street but like it was just this like there's also emotions in dreams too so it's a lot of like emotions about like not being able to get in touch with people um the sort of a little bit of despair of like knocking on the door and not getting an answer okay yeah so all that sounds familiar but to use this specific example like is there a color for the truck do you remember the truck having a particular color no but i like know what the truck looks like okay yeah we should sort of table this and circle back to it at a future time like read the post about a fantasia you might have like a weak version of it too because when i talk to people who um are mm -hmm. like normal visualizers they can actually like very richly see basically movies in their heads like they can close their eyes and describe scenes and say yeah that's green or that car is red or things like that and that's oh i see but it's yeah, a so concept but it's like the movie it's like it's be like being in a movie but it's got concepts cuz movies yeah. are just concepts but, yeah. but sticking with literal ones for like concepts like pie i don't know what it would mean to dream of pie but i have thought of pie in that way yeah but apple pie but you know the num the mathematical oh, concept but uh, like trucks and doors and mansions and stuff like that other people i think uh, probably have stronger visualization than either of us hmm that makes yeah. sense But huh. like this is also relates back to Myers Briggs. Like Ts typically don't have so like F supposedly I got this from my friend who anyways um the her understanding is that Fs experience the world more richly than Ts do. Like they're they're like memories tend to be more high fidelity than T T memories. I don't know what that uh, is. Uh, maybe, maybe it's like an N thing. Maybe because I think uh, this is this is probably not like a myers brick correlation it's a stronger thing than that because a fantasia is like a much more narrow condition like a, only a tiny minority have it but uh, maybe a lot of nt's have it perhaps maybe i, I could believe it yeah. um but yeah my dreams uh, uh, are concept are very conceptual and like seen but it's kind of interesting that you described yourself as a seer that's why i was like getting all sensory about it like if you call yourself a seer of the future as opposed to like a futurist who kind of like conceptually works out the future or something like that like predict there's other people who think of the future primarily in terms of predictions right like mm. um will so and so win the election or not right 
that's a different way of thinking about the future, whereas you do the seer thing. Yeah, it's different. It's not really like prediction. I mean, I do make predictions about how things are going to work out, but it's like, it's not, uh, I think my predictions typically have to do with human behavior, like how my understanding of a person's personality, like will combine with other like things that have happened and like what that will result in. So I do all of my reasoning about future events from personalities. Yeah, but, but that I wouldn't call it futurism per se. That's more like, it, it's not so much prediction as problem solving. Like, you know, somebody has these traits and then faced with a given situation, how will they react? That's not, it could be that that refers to something that's about to happen in the future. Like, you know, maybe a friend is getting married and they kind of react to like, high stakes events in a particular way. So you make a prediction that they'll have like a, you know, a drama moment in the wedding, right? And that might be a prediction if it so happens that they're like um, getting married in six months or whatever. But if it turns out that that's just a hypothetical you're working through, then that's just a problem you're solving. So it's not really futurism, I think. It's more like speculative reasoning. So I, I think a future, like I think the way I do futures is really, I. I see the future in the present. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of what trend spotting is to me. Like there's a bunch of things you look around, something pops out as, at you as, hey, this is more meaningful than the random noise around you. Yeah. And therefore premium mediocre is a thing that wasn't so strong, is strong and might get stronger, right? So that's kind of how I think about the future in terms of like higher salience of things that pop. You know, I'm going to be honest, Venkat, I did not realize, I'm not going to call it easy, I'm not going to say it's an easy thing to do, because I realize it's not for a lot of people, but realizing that that's like what you, that that's a thing you can do, is just look around and figure out what's going to be in a hot, like, five, ten years from now, I was like, oh, it's like always been that way, like, things have never, this is not like a new thing that like, I am just now, I feel like I'm more capable of kind of enough things that I thought were cool and interesting have like reached the point where they've like actually become things that I'm like oh that's what's going on there oh I understand how this works now you just look out and you figure out what the things are and just because I know about it doesn't mean everyone knows about it I think that's like my that's usually my downfall like the reason that I holds me back from telling other people about it or making like a bigger note of certain things is because so you're saying you also tend to spot these things in the environment, but you kind of like don't react as strongly as you should or something? Yeah, exactly. I kind of dismiss it as important. I dismiss its importance because I think it's obvious. Huh. Yeah, and I think uh, there's like multiple steps, like any kind of thinking, there's like uh, bits and pieces of it. And some of those pieces, when they line up, you get like very effective behavior. So for example, being a good investor probably is like a chain of three behaviors. Like mm -hmm. one is uh, spotting something as significant in the environment. Step two is spotting that everybody else has not spotted it as significant. And step three is figuring out a way to structure a bet on it, right? And you have to have all three. Like it's like, that's significant. Nobody else has spotted it. And if I buy this particular option or something, then I will be able to win if I'm right. And then you sort of make a risky bet. And I think I'm good at the first one. The second one, like you, it took me a while to realize that others were not all, uh, always keeping up. And the third, I don't think, um, like, unless it's extremely obvious and easy, it's like, you know, buy this stock, then I can do it. But if it's like, I think the housing market will go down in this particular way, and I have to do this beer credit default swap to make it happen, I can't do that shit at all, right? So, um, otherwise I would have done something with the subprime mortgage or something. That's when I didn't see coming, but you, you get the idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting though when you talk about the subprime mortgage stuff to like speaking of things that you can like see and then place bets on, so to speak. Um, I think it's the interesting thing about the subprime mortgage thing is that the guy who came up with that idea did a lot of research, right? It wasn't like no one who was like far away from the subprime mortgage like industry was able to see that coming, but people who like spent time in the data were able to see that that was going to happen if that makes yep. sense so it was like reasoning from reality so like see, i guess i'm trying to say that like there is some aspect of seeing that leads to better thinking 
that if you the more you see and are aware of what's like the on ground patterns are, then it's easier to project forward from that. Whereas if you're not yeah. able to see what's actually happening, then your ability to project forward is like not very is never going to be very high fidelity or um, like accurate. Oh yeah, totally. Like in the proportion of those two things, seeing versus thinking, mm -hmm. I think seeing is like nine tenths of the game. Like if you see better, the thinking part is trivial. Like um, this reminds me of like Alan Kay's line that perspective is worth 80 IQ points. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also this quote I like uh, from Arthur C. Clarke, who I, which I quote a lot, which is there's two kinds of failures of, um, you know, I think he called it failures of prophecy. One is failure of imagination and the other is failure of nerve. I think I mentioned this before. So, and Arthur Clarke claimed that the failure of nerve is way more common and failure of imagination is not actually that common. So a lot of people can see the future coming, but very few have the nerve to kind of like take the next couple of steps and go ahead and bet on it, right? Yeah, that's placing the bet, right? Because that's risky. Yeah. Um, or, or even like being bold enough to realize that what you're seeing is not necessarily what others are also seeing. And like, there's this, I, it's, I guess, part of the typical mind fallacy. It's like, oh, if I see it, everybody else must see it too. And therefore it's not it's important. In. And yeah. It's probably priced in. If you think everyone else can see it, then you assume it's priced in. Yeah, and then you don't do anything about it. Do anything. But, uh, speaking of prices and priced in, and you mentioned just now that you started a new newsletter and I just subscribed. So yeah, tell everybody else what your new newsletter is about. Yeah, so I've been doing mining at home, cryptocurrency mining at home and other, yeah, mostly cryptocurrency mining at home for the last two years now. <laughs> um, and I have a, a friend who I've been like, kind of who knows more, like what I've been up to. I, I don't really talk about it ever anywhere. Um, and my friend finally talked me into writing all of my adventures and exploits down into a new newsletter chronologue, um, kind of a place to write how to's on to get into stuff. Um, just like sort of a play by play um, venture into the world of like mining cryptocurrencies at home. Um, so uh, your uh, new, I just subscribed by the way, and the, the first couple of posts are great for those of you who want to subscribe. Oh, nice. uh, the newsletter is called chain fail right and yeah. sounds like you uh, and i think the um, tagline is uh, nifty's shitcoin chronicles so how many of these stories do you have like how many shit coins have you tried to mine like do you have enough to sustain a newsletter um i've got two years worth of stories and i feel like i have new stuff happening every day that i want to like add a little thing to but i'm not i'm trying to like not flood the newsletter all at once so i'm going to try and like um, rate limit myself. So I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of backlog I need to get through. I got to get everyone up to speed on what's going on with my stuff up to today. Um, that doesn't answer your question. How many different things have I mined? I have mined, I think it's in one of my posts. I'm like currently mining three things. Yeah. Three. Okay. But there's more than one story with each thing, right? Like, I mean, your Bitcoin mining adventures would be like, 10 chapters of the newsletter or something, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. So basically the conclusion is with all your mining experiments, you are single-handedly responsible for all the climate change, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, I, I do, I think at one point, I don't know if it's in the newsletter I've sent out yet that like talks about how like power went out in Texas a few months ago. It was definitely my fault. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to the gritty um, episode newsletter. I think huh. like, if I'm doing it chronologically, I think that one's going to be, or, or like a, maybe a few months from that, but yeah. Um, All right. So shit coins and thinking about the future through shit coins. So you've spotted a lot yeah. of shit coins, so I won't give you too many points for that. But. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I've kind of also been playing around with the DeFi stuff and there's different tokens in that and things that I think are interesting. So if you count staking as mining, and I probably should do a whole post on this because I think it's interesting. Um, I'm staking even more things. I think I've got like three or four things that stake, staked, whatever. Um, I'd like to get back to mining Ethereum at home, but I'm waiting till my Chia stops getting plotted anyways. All right. So mining adventures. We'll be talking more about it, I'm sure. Yeah. Great. The episodes if you want to subscribe it's chainfail.substack.com um go look it up there's good stuff it's also on my twitter cool all right so is that it for thinking i think that's all i've got yeah all right so that's thinking about thinking 
All right, always a pleasure. Yes. Next time is you, right? So we'll start, think up a you topic. That's right. Bye, Venkat. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.